Welcome to your damn jets. What I want to do today is to give you an overview of the stem cell transplant procedure. Uh, I'm not going to go over the details of how it was for me, but I'm going to give you the overview of how the process goes. And then in later episodes, I'm going to go over how it was uh, for me. Um, and the process um, can differ depending on where you go. Um, they have different procedures, they use different products, they use different timelines. Uh, don't be surprised if your process is somewhat different from mine. Um, my overview is based on what they told me and how mine went. Um, and even in the same place, sometimes complications can happen and they can need to change your process. So uh, don't don't listen to this and think it's going to be exactly like like I experienced. Um, I should also tell you that I had a autologous stem cell transplant. It was my own cells that they gave me back versus giving uh, somebody the cell, cells that come from someone else. Uh, so mine was uh, was of the easier kind. And you should also keep that in mind if you're gonna, gonna get uh, an allo transplant. Um, it's not exactly the same process. First of all, I should mention that I switch providers for the stem cell transplant and I went from Johns Hopkins to UMMC and UMMC is the University of Maryland Medical Center if I recall correctly. Um, they're in Baltimore also they're fairly close to Johns Hopkins the difference in travel time from my house makes almost no difference but there were there were multiple differences uh, with the way they did it at UMMC versus Johns Hopkins and at Johns Hopkins the reason I didn't want to have my stem cell transplant there is that the head of, of what they call the bone marrow transplant unit or something uh, he was a moron um, so that what, that's what made me change but I discovered after the fact that um, the process at UMMC was better for us than at Johns Hopkins and I'm going to explain why UMMC kept me in the hospital for the whole transplant. So I was there for getting my initial chemo to kill all my lymphocytes. Uh, I stayed there to get my stem cells back. And then I was there after the transplant. Versus Johns Hopkins, the plan was to admit me to the hospital for one week. And then after that, I would have had to find housing in Baltimore and travel between the housing and the hospital and go to the clinic every day um, and spend many hours at the clinic, pretty much a whole day. Um, and that that was a big deal for us. It, it was weighing on our mind. Finding housing in Baltimore was weighing on our mind. And I found that the people uh, dealing with cell cell transplants at Johns Hopkins were very unhelpful to uh assuage those um, worries um, you know oh don't worry it's gonna happen it's gonna happen it's like we got answers that didn't really answer anything and sometimes we didn't get answers and that's why I decided to go to uh, UMMC UMMC I th turned out in the end to be less expensive for us because you see our insurance covers medical expenses, but it doesn't cover lodging unless you're like, you need to travel by plane to the hospital. It doesn't cover lodging. We would have had to pay for the lodging in Baltimore versus UMMC. I was in the hospital the whole, for the whole process and the insurance just paid for the medical care that I got at that time. Um, so it turned out to be less expensive for us. And I did not know that ahead of time and discover that after the fact um, so if there's something you need to to know is uh, shop for your stem cell transplant maybe even for chemo you know I was happy with my chemo at Johns Hopkins but um, shop for services like the stem cell transplant because they can use very different procedures and one procedure may be better for you logistically than than the other. Trying to find housing in, in Baltimore during a pandemic. Like, you know, I, we were reading descriptions of the places. And some places had, like, uh, communal kitchens. 
we're in a pandemic. Why? What are we going to do there? And I'm getting a stem cell transplant. I'm at risk of getting infections. I don't want to do that. Um, so I don't know who benefits from Johns Hopkins system. In my mind, in my mind, there is no patient who can benefit from that. It, who it benefits are the insurance companies who then don't have a lesser burden to pay, maybe. I don't know, actually. I have I, I have no idea, but it doesn't benefit me. And if it doesn't benefit me, well, then, you know, I don't care. Uh, do whatever you want, but I don't suggest that people go to Johns Hopkins for a stem cell transplant because of that. You know, you may, you may have a great relationship with the head of the stem cell transplant unit, but if that's how they do the stem cell transplant, I, tell, I say don't go there, go to UMMC. Then, okay, let's talk about the transplant itself. Um, the transplant begins uh, with preparation for the transplant. So what they want to, to do is to ensure that you're going to be able <laughs> to survive the transplant because it's, it's a big shock to your system. So I had breathing tests where I had to be in a booth and blow into the device. Um, I had echocardiograms. I had other tests. I'm sure that I don't remember. Um, some of the tests may have piggybacked on, on two other tests that I needed to have anyway because of my heart disease or something else. Uh, but I remember the echocardiogram that was specifically for the stem cell transplant. The dental clearance, I also had to have a dental clearance, and I mentioned it before that I started getting a dental clearance for uh, Johns Hopkins. It turns out that you, when I told that to UMMC, they said, oh, you have a dental clearance already signed for Johns Hopkins. Just send it to us. I thought they were going to say, well, you, you need, the doctor needs to sign our form. And, but no, they said, just send us the Johns Hopkins clearance form and it's going to be good for us. And it was good for them. They didn't ask me to go back to the dentist and ask him to sign another form. Uh, and I was very grateful about that because I didn't want to travel for nothing. Uh, not that the dentist is far away from our house, but I just don't want the aggravation. Um, so they, they tested me before going for the transplant. And part of the reason they do that is they want to make sure that you're going to survive it, that you have a good chance of, of benefiting from it. There are people who are too weak or have too many comorbidities uh, that they cannot take the transplant. I should mention also, because it's in the news these days, that uh, I never put up any fight about getting vaccinations for my... Uh, during chemo or anything, um, I got my COVID shots and uh, I now have the booster also now. Uh, I don't know what would have happened if I had put up a fight to say I don't want the vaccines. I, I suspect that the my place in the priority list would have changed. Because it's like everything else in life. You have limited resources and they need to prioritize the people who have the best chance of making it through and surviving after. Um, and something as basic as the vaccine, uh, to me, it's like you're saying, you know, I don't care if I live after the transplant, if you're refusing the COVID vaccine. So I suspect they would have, they might not have like eliminated me from the program, but I would have been demoted. So other people would have passed before me. Uh, Ultimately, I cannot tell you what would have happened, but I suspect that's what would have happened. And vaccines are going to come back in my little talk today later. So then they installed uh, what they call a Hickman line. It's it's basically it's you have two tubes coming out of your chest over here, and um, they use that for getting the blood out and putting the blood in. The, you cannot use a port for that. I, I asked my doctor, actually, you know, when you're putting a Hickman line into me, uh, it's another surgery, it's another, com you know, more brouhaha. Could you just use the port? Um, they cannot use the port for that. And I don't think there's really any port on the market that it can use instead of a Hickman line for an autologous stem cell transplant. That's what I was told. If the transplant is allo, then it is possible when they give you the cells to put 
put it into a port and it's just going to be slower but for collecting cells out of you they need to have a hickman line and so it installed a hickman line i know i have people online who told me well they did it through the port i don't know if they're misremembering i don't know if they're trans i at that time we didn't talk about aloe versus um auto so i don't know if their transplant was aloe and then yes they could do it because it's an aloe transplant but normally they, they need to install a hickman line um and the installation was pretty fast and simple um and they they, they taught me uh also how to um how to take care of it because you get it before they start taking the cells out of your body that's when you 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 get it you can get it a few weeks before they, they start taking the cells out of your body um and um you need to keep it uh, working so i had to flush it every day they, they showed me how to flush it and i just flushed it every day there was no problem then after you have the Hickman installed, you at some point they're going. Then they give you a schedule and everything about you know when to start doing this and when to start doing that. And then you have at some point you have to start self injecting yourself with a a drug that pushes the stem cells out of the bone marrow. Uh, and that's done outpatient. So you inject yourself. They, they, again, the, the, it's demonstrated to you. You have a little thing with a little needle and you. you put it in your belly and you press on the plunger and so on and so forth then after the the injections and it's all timed so you inject yourself the the cells come out then like maybe four days i don't remember the timeline exactly but four days after you started injecting yourself um you have one to two days of blood filtering uh, and that's also done outpatient. Um, you come in in the morning very early and they hook you up to a machine and it, it takes your blood and it filters it. It's a little bit like a dialysis machine. It filters your blood and takes the stem cells out of your blood. Um, and it can be one to two days usually. Mine was done in one day. Some people n need more days. I, I know somebody who needed at least, I think, three days before they got enough cells. And in my case, um, I was there for one day and they got three times the amount that they wanted. <laughs> and then you, know, you also get more injections during that time. Um, if you need to come back for the next few days, then you get more injections. Otherwise, you stop injecting yourself. So for me, it's like the first day they took the cells out and, and they told me that I had way more than needed and they said, you can stop injecting yourself. Um, then then you go back home and a few days or maybe a few weeks after that, depending on the place and their schedule, they admit you for the transplant and then you go into the hospital. Um, you probably, at this point, they're probably still operating under the procedure where everybody has a COVID test, so you get a COVID test to make sure that you're not going into the hospital with COVID. Uh, though they give you, they give it to you there, so you could, they could have a bad discovery, but I don't know what they do then because I never had COVID. Um, then they give you a high dose chemo to kill all of your lymphocytes, so your immune system is wiped out. Uh, and it takes a few days for it to do its work. And there's a day that is put on the calendar as uh, day zero. And um, on day zero, they give you back uh, your stem cells. Um, and then you recover. In my case, I was in the hospital. I recovered the whole time in the hospital. I was there. I think total from day one to day zero, to last day was maybe two weeks. Um, I recovered in the hospital, and there were days that were good, and there were days that were bad, and there were days where I vomited, and there were days where I was finer than other days, and there were days where I just couldn't, I didn't want to eat anything because it tasted chalky. It was ups and downs. Um, then you have the, then eventually they discharge you, and you can ring the bell when they discharge you. As far as side effects go, uh, you remind, I'm reminding you that. Um, you have uh, it's the roulette of side effects again I know for chemo you have a roulette and you have another roulette for the stem cell transplant where you don't there's a long list of side effects you don't know which one you're gonna get um, I had tiredness I had vomiting uh, I had gastric problems I had taste problems uh, other people may have a different list of side effects um, and maybe they can even have less side effects than I did. I don't know about that. 
um, that was in the hospital. Outside of the hospital, I, you know, the hair loss, very likely you're going to have a hair problem when you get out of the hospital. And I thought it was going to happen in the hospital, but no, it happens after. Um, I don't, I, I had a little bit of hair loss, and this hair loss that you see at the front is, was from before the, lymph, the lymphoma, and so I don't think the chemo will change anything to that. Um, but my hair, I, I lost some hair. I know this because I could look at the keyboard and, and see the hairs on the keyboard. Uh, but mostly my hair stopped growing. Then it came back, I, I think maybe a month and a half or three months. I, I, I'm not, I am going to have to look at my notes <laughs> and then, and the next episodes to, to tell you how long it took for my hair to come back. But, uh, then I also had gastric problems even after the hospital where they gave me medicine to try to control it. And, uh, I eventually was able to, to kick, uh, I had diarrhea daily basically at some point. Um, and tiredness after after the stem cell transplant. Uh, and then and there were days where I didn't want to do anything. It takes six months or years to, re- to recover. And I think I was closer to six months than a year. So in theory, I'm already re- recovered from the transplant. Uh, because I'm on day 222 after the transplant. I checked before doing this video. And the recovery can, so it can be longer or shorter. And it's in, you know, not everything happens at the same time. My hair came back first. Uh, the, my energy came back first. And, and for that period of time, you have to protect yourself from infection. And this is, you know, there's COVID going around currently. But even without COVID, the rules are all the same for somebody with a stem cell transplant. Uh, COVID makes a little difference, but not much. Uh, you know, they, they were telling me if you go outside and you're within six months of your t- stem cell transplant, put a mask on. This is with or without COVID, you put the mask on. Why? Because you don't want to breathe in the spores. You don't want to breathe in the mold uh, because they can attack you. And I was lucky that I didn't have any infections. Um after the stem cell transplant, and even sometimes I, I was thinking, oh shit, I'm going to have an, you know, I cut myself, I'm going to have an infection. Um, but that didn't happen. Besides protecting yourself from infection, the other thing that you need to do is retake all the childhood vaccinations that you had before, like MMR, to mention one that I remember, uh, pneumonia and all, all kinds of stuff. I also had the shingrix because I, my shingles were activated by my the chemo treatment I had before the stem cell transplant. I'm surprised that the stem cell transplant did not reactivate again, again the, the, the shingles, but I, I had shingrix, two shots of shingrix, and it was the, the shingrix vaccine was rough. So, uh, yeah, you have to retake all the vaccinations. And that's why I think, like, if I had started putting up a fuss about vaccinations, they would have looked at me and maybe evaluated me differently in their priorities. Because, as I said, the resources are limited. And you're going to say, well, they're giving you your stem cells back. So, you know, there's no resources being used. But that's not true. Because the nurses, the doctors, they're all busy with you when you're there. If you're not there and they put someone else in place, then they're not busy with you and they can help someone else. So the resources are always limited, even if you're getting back your own organ. Um, I got back my own stem cells, but the resources are always limited. So I don't know where I would have landed on the list if I had start, started putting a fuss about vaccines. And then uh, the other thing for recovery is uh, I need to have MRIs periodically. Uh, I had two MRIs already after the chemo. They both came back uh, clean. I'm going to have another MRI in, in towards the end of March uh, because right now the MRIs are every three months. Um, eventually, uh, it's going to be spaced out more like every half year. And then eventually, I think it should be yearly. Um, and, but I think I'm going to have MRIs until I leave this planet or a doctor says this guy is so banged up that MRIs are not going to make any difference. <laughs> I mean, you know, we don't know what, what's going to happen. Um, so it's the, the MRIs for the foreseeable future for, for somebody like me, 
because I have a PCNS lymphoma, so they have to look in the brain and for, to look in the brain to detect that they need an MRI. For someone who has a, a more classical lymphoma, uh, they I think it's a CAT scan that that they do periodically if they get a stem cell transplant. Um, because for other types of lymphoma, it may not be the stem cell transplant that is suggested as a consolidation treatment. Remember, I had a uh, my induction treatment was chemo. My consolidation treatment is uh, the stem cell transplant. And some, some, and for some lymphomas, they may not send you to get a stem cell transplant after you get your chemo. They, it may be watch and wait. It, it, there's all kinds of procedures that they use um, to decide what your your next step is going to be. And for some people, there's no next step. It's watch and wait and see what happens. You know. Um, so yeah, this was the, the, the overview of the transplant procedure that I got. Uh, if there's a lesson learned for me, the lesson learned that I learned through my stem cell transplant experience is shop around because UMMC turned out to be better for us than going to Johns Hopkins where we would have had to pay for a housing in Baltimore, whereas at UMMC, my my wife didn't stay there, but she would come every almost every day. Not every day. There were days where she was tired and she decided to stay home, and I, I understood that, and I let her, you know, no no pressure. You can stay home, uh, and we communicated through um, the Duo app on my Chromebook, and it was fine. Uh, but the days that she wanted to see me, she would she would have to drive there. And then she might have lunch with me and, and then come back home. Um, and that worked fine for us because we didn't have to try to find some place to live temporarily in Baltimore. Um, so shop around, for especially for a stem cell transplant. For the chemo, you may be more squeezed in terms of, you know, timeline. In my case, I think I was close, close to dying. <laughs> so it, I, it was not time to go back home and like, hmm, where am I going to get my chemo? Um, but for the stem cell transplant, I, I wish I had been a little bit more on the ball and started shopping before I had problems with the head of the stem cell transplant unit. So yeah, that's the overview. In the next episodes, I'm going to go over... You know how the transplant went for me uh, step by step um, so for now I'm going to say goodbye and uh, see you next episode